All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Reality Check, the science of fiction. And today we have Dr. Christina Wright with us here today, and she is a neuroscientist by training who received her PhD from Boston College and specialized in the neurobiological basis of pathological fear, which to me is so fascinating because fear is a whole science in and of itself. And today we're talking about something that could be quite terrifying for a lot of people, which is the movie Total Recall and the memory implantation that they used in the movie. So Christina, I don't know if you got a chance to see Total Recall or read up on it, but tell, tell me just some of your initial thoughts with the movie. Oh, I am going to be completely honest with you. I did not have a chance to watch the whole thing. So there, there's my caveat right there. However, I did listen to watch and read a few summaries. And I think that it touches on a really interesting topic. And it's timely in where we are from a research standpoint to think about whether or not this is something that could be a reality. How far are we from this being fiction versus something that could happen, what are the ethical implications, etc. I think maybe the thing that stood out to me the most was the, at the end, you still don't really know what was real and what was fake. <laughs> but those were kind of my initial takeaways. Yeah, no, and it's I've watched both versions, the original one with Arnold Schwarzenegger, and then the newer version, which I prefer the Arnold version, even though he's like, I feel so bad saying this. He's not the best actor, but it's so 80s. It's so cheesy and gory and crass. And it's like, there's so many things they say in it. They're like, oh my gosh, they would never say that now. And the C, well, not even the CGI, but the the prosthetics and the makeup is so 80s. It's so over the top. But I think one of the really terrifying concepts in this movie is the fact that he doesn't know. <laughs> is this a memory or is this not, is this real or is this not? So I don't know if you could speak to a little bit of how memories work. Yeah, absolutely. And before we get into that, I do want to encourage you to watch the documentary on Arnold Schwarzenegger's life that just came out not too long ago because it like goes over his progression as an actor and it's fascinating. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's good to know. But back to the memory point, how do memories work well? There are like a billion different theories. And by a billion, I mean, there are major, probably like four major theories as to how memories take root in the brain, what their function is, how they develop, what makes things stick, what makes things not stick. I think for the purposes of this, what we want to maybe zoom in on is what makes memories different from reality. Is that what where we want to maybe go first or... Well, I guess I guess I would like to under because I don't actually understand how exactly memories work. And I've heard things that may or may not be true. For example, I've heard that every time we access a memory, it degrades somehow. So I have, you know, college 101 base yep. level biology training, and I understand how neurons work. And I think most people understand how neurons work in the most basic sense. But when it comes to actual memories, like what are they? Is it just data stored in the brain? Is it a neuron itself? Is it code within a neuron? What is the memory? Yep, that's a great question. Okay, so what you're speaking of when you're referring to that degradation process that can happen when you bring up a memory every time is part of the theory of reconsolidation. So it's a very robust and reliable uh, theory of kind of how memory works. And essentially what it refers to is once you have something that gets stored in the brain as a memory, you have the ability to pull it back up into the top of your mind and do something with it, you know, bringing it into consciousness. This is how we interact with thoughts that we have stored over time and use them to interact with our present environment. And each time you bring it up, you have to remember that you have other new information in your brain that wasn't there when you filed it away previously. So it's not necessarily that it's going to degrade, degrade every time, but every time you resurface it, you have the opportunity to edit it just a little bit because you're incorporating it with a whole bunch of new thoughts and information that weren't there previously. So what that can do is, over time, cause you to edit that memory in a way that maybe you weren't planning to, and it can actually become fundamentally different than the original one you stored however many years ago. Um, 
there is actually also a piece that refers to when you pull that memory up, it can actually get stronger each time kind of a practice, uh, practice theory, if you will, you know, every time you bring something up and you think about it more, you're strengthening its neural connection in your brain before filing it back away. So I wouldn't say degradation is the necessarily the thing that's happening. Just reframing is probably happening more accurately. Super interesting. So that would be a good explanation as to why I might have a memory as a child playing with some toys, but I don't remember if this is an actual memory or if I remember it because I saw it on a home video recording and I've watched that recording so many times that it reinforced the, the childhood memory. Exactly. And I think that's one of the biggest takeaways to keep in mind when it comes to memory is that it's not reality. It's not fact. And it is very much generated by your brain and what you have going on in your brain. So I think it's really dangerous in a lot of instances to rely on your memory and really feel like super certain that you know that's exactly how something happens. It's just not true. And that's what makes eyewitness testimony really challenging. But uh, yeah. that's a conversation for many of you know. <laughs> and I have heard that like there's uh, there's the whole, you know, what was the criminal wearing and someone's like he was wearing a blue shirt and he was standing behind me and someone else is like well it was a she and she was wearing a yellow shirt and she was standing in front of you it's mm -hmm. like their memories are completely different and that's mm -hmm. just so fascinating that our different experiences can I, I guess I like the word you said edit it can edit the memory in the way that we recall it so given that understand that surface level understanding of how that works are we are we able to like corrupt somebody's memory of something by repeating it like to them? Like if I'm telling a story to a friend and I'm confidently telling them, no, you were wearing a blue shirt, I promise you, would that start to change their memory of the way they remembered a certain day or event? I think it certainly could. If you, It depends on your relationship with that person, right? If some random person off the street is trying to convince you that they know something more about something than you do, you're far less likely to take them seriously and take that into consideration and consider, you know, maybe I could have been wrong. But if it's someone you trust and you admire or you look up to and they're saying, oh, no, you're absolutely inaccurate on that, then yeah, that can lead you to reconsider whether or not your original interpretation of a, of a situation was correct and can lead you to change your mind and therefore change your memory. So what happens to the old memory? Because I'm just thinking of it like file containers. Does the old memory get stored further back and it gets like overwritten, like it gets covered with the new memory? Yeah. Is it still because it's still there? It's a great question. So there are a few different theories on this, and there's still quite a bit of work to be done to determine exactly how these pieces are filed away in the brain and physically where they manifest themselves. Like if I were to look at the brain, where is this memory? How is it laid out, et cetera? Still a lot of work to be done there. But I would say probably the easiest way to think about it is back to that editing principle, right? So you can pull up that original memory, edit it a little bit, add new information. Oh, this guy or person that I really admire says I'm wrong. I must be wrong. Let me change that and then tuck it back away. I would say from a like real estate standpoint, it would be highly impractical for us to store successive versions of separate overlapping memories all over the brain because we would run out of space eventually. So it's probably more likely, given that we have a pretty efficient system, that it would edit, rewrite, and then put it back where it was. Wow. <laughs> That's absolutely insane to me. So on some level, there's bits of our memory that do get taken and thrown out, vanishes into the ether or whatnot, to some level. Because it's like, I, I hate to bring up a negative, but this is part of the science. If somebody has a traumatic memory that the brain hides that memory still in there deep deep tucked away but when we block out traumatic memories they can get accessed later in life and that's something I've always been curious about because I know that smell is a great way to access memories I smell something and I remember when I was 10 years old having this magical experience when it comes to accessing traumatic memories or hiding traumatic memories what do we know about that as far as just the science of it right now. What is our understanding? So that's a 
super great question and super interesting to me. Definitely a highlight of my uh, a highlight of my previous uh, career. So when you think about a traumatic memory, for example, it's different than a happy memory. It's different than a memory of like a to do list that you have for or a, like a grocery shopping list, right? And something that's a little bit more more mundane. So. Traumatic memories are more robust because they are associated with really intense emotional responses. You wouldn't have the same type, same type of intensity associated with a grocery list. So you're more likely to forget. Uh, but when you think about like the ability of a memory to be recalled, the ones that are going to be more robust are therefore more likely to be recalled later. And repressed memories are definitely a real thing. And you could forget and not know and have no conscious understanding of having a memory. And then someday, however many years down the road, you get triggered in a particular way and have that brought up into your consciousness. Totally. Memories that are more likely to last that long are more salient because they either are associated with a really strong emotion or they have like multimodal information associated with them. Meaning you have a certain sight that is triggered, you have a certain smell that's triggered, maybe a sound, maybe an emotion, the more facets and types of information that come through your senses that are aligned with that and the more powerful they are, make that memory more and more robust and more and more likely to be triggered later on. Fear or traumatic memories are one of the strongest things that that we have. And so therefore, they are quite likely to be triggered uh, later on. Let me pause and see if you have any follow-up questions there because I think I'm about yeah. to go down another route. Yeah, well, so that has to do with the myelin sheath, right? The myelin sheath is like sort of the integrity of the memory. And my understanding of that is the myelin sheath grows stronger. And I'll let you explain what that is, but it grows stronger with two things, either repetition or something very intense that was very strong to remember, either positive or negative. So I think... A little point of clarification there. The myelin sheath is really critical for improving the ability of a signal to get from one neuron to another. Without the myelin sheath, a signal has to travel much more slowly. And so it's not very efficient. And if a signal doesn't get from one neuron to another quickly and efficiently, that connection dies over time because it's, it's not like not getting plugged in <laughs> fast enough and powerful enough to actually charge something. So when you think about the myelin sheath, if we're, lo if we're looking at a neuron, we have a long axon, that's a tail that connects one neuron to another. And neurons communicate with each other by sending electrical and chemical signals to communicate with each other all over the brain and create these really fascinating and beautiful circuits. Um, myelin sheaths are like little buoys that are, all, that are along that axon. And so when you put those little buoys on that axon, and I'm imagining like if you're at one of those public swimming arenas outside in a lake, you know, like they have that rope that has like those little buoys on it. It's just like that. And from there, you have an electrical signal that doesn't need to go through every little piece of that neuron axon anymore. It can jump. So it makes it a lot faster. So it goes boom and it's there instead of. <laughs> Your lesson of this, just I had a vivid reminder of the when I was in anatomy class and he had us all go around the room and clap one student at a time. Yep. Yep. He's like, that's a poor, like a poor neuron connection, having us each clap one at a time. And then he yep. had us practice clapping every other person and it went faster. And then yep. we did every fifth person, it went even faster. And then we did like every like 15th student clapped and the signal went around the room and like couple seconds so that was our that was my little lesson in anatomy so yeah it's super interesting so that that sheath can be stronger or weaker and that's going to improve the signal of the neurons being able to talk to each other and the yeah. quality of the memory not going to improve the quality of the memory directly but it is going to improve the ability of a neuron to speak with another neuron and develop a stronger connection. And it's the stronger connection between neurons that is the foundation of a memory. So what I mean by that is there's a whole principle called neurons that fire together, wire together. If there's no firing, then there are no connections in the brain because at, the neurons aren't active. If they are firing, 
but they're not firing like in a way that they're connecting efficiently with one an- one to another, then if connections are not super strong, they'll die. <laughs> so when so what think- happens to a dead neuron? So unfortunately, if you die, if, if a neuron dies because it's not being used, you won't usually get that neuron back. So we need to keep using our brains as much as possible to maintain as many of our neurons functioning throughout our lives. So constantly learn, constantly like just try and exercise, take care of your body, do whatever you can to keep your brain healthy because it's the only one you got. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. It's it's almost like it really is kind of use it or lose it because I took my first major in college was American Sign Language and I took four years yeah. of it and I try yeah. to think I'm like, can I sign my name? That's about it. And it's like, I have lost a whole language and I know that's so many people's experience do so they're dead so if I wanted to relearn a language it's not like it's atrophied and I need to just strengthen Mm -hmm. it again it's dead and I need to rebuild it so I know I should step that back a little bit so there there is the possibility of neurons dying for sure if they're not being used more likely in a healthy brain those neurons have been recruited to do some other type of a job because they weren't being used for that original job But there is also the possibility with like illicit drug use, maybe not enough sleep, maybe not enough dreaming that your neurons can die. And then they're really hard to hard to replace and they probably won't be replaced. Oh, Uh, man. Now I just want to go down the the rabbit hole of dreams. I'm going to try and stay good today and keep us on topic. I didn't I didn't yet answer your second question about the strength of the memory and how that's related to or not related to the myelin sheath. So I just want to make sure that's crystal clear. So the myelin sheath increases the ability of a neuron to effectively communicate with another neuron. But the foundation of a memory is a cluster of neurons firing together and strengthening that connection over time so that anytime you trigger that memory, a whole map of neurons that are devoted to holding on to that memory light up and activate for you to experience that. And then they deactivate when you put it away. So that's- So here's an anecdote that we can speak to. Years ago, I was in a minor motorcycle accident. I, (laughs) you know, stupid story. I was a newer rider and I was driving in the springtime. They salt the roads and I slid out on salt and I just had a minor accident. And then back to back with that, I can't remember which one came first. I was also in a ski accident, which was a little bit more traumatic. I was not wearing a helmet. Wear your helmet, kids. <laughs> Wear your helmets and don't ski in trees. And I hit my head pretty bad. And mm-hmm. ever since I had those two accidents back to back, I have been afraid of anything that's going fast. So if I get on, if I get in a car, and usually it's left hand turns. If I'm in a yeah. car at high speeds turning left, I get scared. If I'm in an airplane, and I was never scared of airplanes before, and we hit turbulence, it got really bad for a while. I've been working on it, but I would be the person who was just crying and I would be laughing to the person next to me. And I'm like, I knew this was going to happen. Don't worry about me. I'm just crying. I'm like, my body's scared, but I'm not. And I would talk about how I'm like, it's a physical fear. I'm not actually scared of planes. I understand it's not going to crash. But ever since that accident created that little fear cluster and I've just been fighting tooth and nail to not be scared of airplanes ever since. Is that a correct assessment? Yeah, absolutely. And I think what you're really describing is a fear memory that you created and was stored in your brain. And although you've addressed some of like the conscious pieces, right, in an attempt to overwrite this by understanding and knowing that like I'm in an airplane, this is safe, like I can tell my friend that this is probably going to happen, but like I know that this is not how I should respond. You've tried to combat it a little, but there are some emotional responses that trigger physical responses, which is kind of similar to what you would expect in post-traumatic stress disorder or anxiety and fear disorders, where if that brain pathway that was created and activated and generated fear during that time when you were experiencing these accidents and this trauma, if it's triggered, it doesn't matter what you think. It's just going to make your body do what it thinks your body needs to do, which is express fear. Mm -hmm. And that was actually part of my dissertation work was figuring out what part of your brain creates this estimation of how much fear your body should produce to a given stimuli. Like, are there neurons that are responsible for doing the math and saying like, this is potentially scary, but I can see that I'm safe 
and like this is not a place where I really need to run and freak out or like or what and what I ended up discovering is that there are literally neurons that do that math and then tell you how to behave and they are in the fear part of the brain or one of the parts that we think is really important for fear and when you have those neurons messing up their calculations that's when you can get over exaggerated fear responses to things that really shouldn't be that scary, which is what you're describing. So it could be that your estimation is just a little bit off and reasonably so because you experienced something really traumatic before and it was real before. And so what's your brain, like your brain is sitting there being like, I know you're telling me that this isn't gonna happen again, but I'm telling you that it's already happened twice. (laughs) It's already happened twice, back to back. No more motorcycle. I'm still gonna ski. Just I'll keep it. I'll keep it the blues and greens. <laughs> yeah. What the hell? Um, so that so the brain doing bad math could be a. It, that's kind of why we have totally irrational fears, like things like phobias, like spiders, and public speaking. I think are two of the biggest fears. And yeah. public speaking isn't. You know, it's not dangerous, but people have such a fear based on maybe a bad experience socially because we have such high social equity. That's interesting. So what about, it sounds like there is some science that we can kind of unpack on memory implantation, because it sounds like we ourselves have the ability to overwrite our own memories to a degree, because it's like, you know, we can overwrite, you know, something that's not scary to be scary, or we can overwrite something that's uh, a negative to become a positive. And we, it sounds like we're constantly doing this already. What about artificially? Are there any artificial processes of false memories or maybe not even artificial? I'm thinking of like, you know, in Total Recall where they hook them up to the giant machine and you have a whole fake vacation or now you're a spy. So it's maybe not always that machine, but what what is the scientific understanding of implanted false or artificial memories? That's a great question. So there's actually a really cool TED talk from Steve Ramirez lab. It's your Steve Ramirez lab. He's based in Boston. It's actually from like 2013. The title like a laser and a mouse or something like that. So I recommend anybody who's interested in this topic, go take a look at that video. But yeah, we do have the ability to implant false memories. And I'll describe how that works. You'll be maybe a little bit disappointed because they're not as elaborate right now as a uh, vacation in Maui or wherever. (laughs) But yes, we can manipulate memories uh, for sure. And we can implant false ones as well. And so to describe a little bit of what they did, and we can go into more detail if you want, but they went into a mouse's brain and this some of it, I use the same techniques in my uh, in my work as well. They went into a mouse's brain and they had a mouse experience fear by, I believe, foot shock in this paradigm, uh, but I could be mistaken. But let's say for argument's sake, we put a mouse in a box, we shock their foot, we make them afraid of this box. While doing that, we put a probe in their brain that allows us to see which neurons light up when they become afraid. And the purpose of that like probe and the purpose of understanding which neurons light up when they're afraid is now we know that those neurons are involved in that fear of memory, right? In that fear experience and that fear of memory happening. So then what they did after they made sure that they knew that this rat was afraid of this box, they then moved this, sorry, I guess it was a mouse, moved the mouse to a new box and then using a light, which activates those same neurons, talk more about how that works, but you can turn on a light and then activate those same exact neurons that activated in a totally different environment where they express fear. And you can make a rat afraid of a new environment and it demonstrate a fear memory in a totally new place that they've never been before just by turning on the same neurons that were responsible for creating that memory in the first place. So now you've created a false memory because you've now made this mouse afraid of something they have no business being afraid of because they've never experienced before. And that's how that works. Wow. So I was the rat. (laughs) I was the rat. I was, I had the ski accident and now I'm scared of airplanes, which are (laughs) correlated because I think my brain took is it was just high speeds. Yeah. It was what was scary to me. And I don't recall the ski accident. Actually, I have no memory of that day. 
but I could only assume that maybe the turbulence of the skis during the crash was something that was scary that my brain locked onto and all those specific neurons lit up. And then those same neurons are getting reinforced on the airplane. So I would say there's a slight difference, right? Because we don't know that we're activating the exact same memory for you when you're on an airplane as when you were in your accident. Whereas in the experimental version, we do know because we've tagged and selected those neurons specifically and then lit them back up in a totally new place. With yours, you could also be experiencing something called fear transfer, right? So you experienced fear in this first environment, and then you've now found yourself in an environment that has some of the same characteristics, which has allowed you to re-bring that past memory up and that past fear experience and fear response up into your present consciousness. And then you've now applied it over multiple times of doing that and iterations of thinking to this new image. So you may have actively done that, not consciously, but you may have actively transferred your fear from one place to another because it was so profound for you. Yeah. So when we're implanting these memories, have we gone beyond mice or is that where the research has stopped? So I would say there's probably a chance that there's been a more recent experiment in a monkey that's happened. Um, and from a human standpoint, I, I don't know what the latest research is from the, the animal. Uh, primate area. But I would imagine since that happened in 2013, that they have probably gone as far as a monkey. From the human standpoint, we've talked about the idea of editing memories in situations such as like post-traumatic stress disorder, where it would be really freaking helpful if we didn't only have to rely on talk therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy to try and overcome with consciousness these really robust fear responses. So at one point, there was a proposition and a bit of experimentation that was being done to see if maybe ketamine, a specific lower dose of ketamine, could be administered timely, like very shortly after a traumatic experience occurred. And while that memory was being created and stored, if you were to inject ketamine when that person was not quite yet fully formed that memory, like, can we interrupt the, recon can we interrupt the consolidation of this experience? and prevent it from being as strong as it may be to create PTSD. Maybe in people who are pro like predisposed to PTSD just because they have a lot of family members or something like that who have experienced similar tendencies. So there has been some discussion about like, can we use drugs to interrupt memories and prevent them from being so profound? But then we get into this question of ethics, right? Like how far can we really go? What is like, what is ethical? Who can be in charge? Is it is it okay to edit someone's memories? You, of course, hope that people would want to do it for good or maybe to inject happy memories. But there's also the converse possibility that someone tries to do something that's more in line with the film, right? And delete someone's identity or delete a memory that's really critical to who they are as a person or or whatnot. I can't think of anything. Really so it sounds like we can edit memories a few different ways. The first one was just environmental, which is kind of the natural way that we edit our memories already. Everyone's doing that every single day. And the second one was the example of the mouse, which would be an electrical edit of the memories. And then the third one you talked about is a chemical edit of the memories. And all three are successful and the, you know, the second two are uh, fields that we're exploring a little bit more. Are there any other potential ways that we could edit memories? Can't think of only at this moment. I would say like some sort of mechanical like interference, right? Some sort of implant or electronic. Yeah, and it would still come down to electronic or chemical because that's it's that's what we are. We're rough. just yeah, big biological <laughs> creatures. So that really kind of gets me thinking about reality and consciousness. Because if we can't even trust our own memories to provide for us the accurate recollection of what happened, I think it kind of brings into question kind of the challenge of what defines consciousness and how our memory can define one's self. Because I have an identity that's built on all of my memories. Mm -hmm. And if I can't trust those memories, how can I trust my identity? So how, from a neuroscience perspective, how can we define identity? 
I love your question. This is great. Thank you. So your identity and also your perception of the world that you live in and what's real and what's not, I actually like to think of, and this is maybe a little bit controversial, as just like a communal hallucination. Oh, man. (laughs) Please tell me more. Your what you have in your brain and how you experience the world is all based up on based upon what you perceive, and what you perceive is completely based upon what you pay attention to. So if you and whatever you pay attention to becomes a part of your little world, and then your little world, along with everybody else's world, is paying attention to a whole slew of things, and usually they're pretty much in line with one another. And so we've developed this idea of reality and come up with customs that we think are appropriate and not appropriate and created all these little rules, but it's really just an agreed upon state. We don't know what how real. It's so fascinating because we have these quips that we use in everyday language. It's like, oh, they're living in their own reality. And it's like, Mm -hmm. they truly are. If that person is taking in a completely different set of sensory information than you are, And I'm not even talking about clinically schizophrenic people, someone living in their own little world. Their reality is truly different than yours. Exactly. And you can't refute it because it is. It fundamentally is. And I think that's where it's really important for me to help people develop more compassion to people who do experience hallucinations, such as, right, people who have schizophrenia or experience some sort of delusion and an inability to understand the reality that we are. It's just that their inputs are different. Their perception of the world is different. Their brain isn't set up to see and observe and understand things in the way that ours is. And so, of course, they're going to come up with a different result. Mm -hmm. And that is their reality, period. Well, and even excuse me, even looking at humans versus animals, because animals are going to take in a completely different set of sensory information as well. So I mean, this is kind of like breaking my brain right now. Sorry, audience, to all you guys listening to this. I hope we all have some time to decompress after this and absorb this. (laughs) But like, you know, my dog's reality is highly based on scent sensory. So his world looks and feels completely different than my world. So this when you talk about neuroscience, it really brings into question what is reality. And I can really see how reality could be so fragile for some people who do use drugs because that mm-hmm. gradient of what we, you said the collective consciousness, what we define as reality, that gradient starts to break down in drug users and the staple reality begins to dissolve. And that's mm-hmm. a terrifying thought. So what what do you teach people when you're talking about developing compassion for others? I think at the center of it all is I think we really need to move away from thinking of people with mental illness and being unstable and of thinking of them as being crazy and and scary and think more of mental disorders as neurobiological disorders. These are brain disorders, just like a disorder that you would have of the heart or the arm or the liver or the leg some sort of problem that you have with a body part. It's exactly that. Just that this time it's with the brain and we don't understand what the problem is yet. So we can't label it. And in the meantime, we've allowed all of these kind of negative associations to take hold, right? That these people are crazy or et cetera, et cetera. So I I would really encourage people to come away from this conversation with thinking about mental illness as just a body part disorder. And it's a brain problem. And we're working really hard to figure out what those issues are so that we can fix them just like any other disease. That's uh, that's really special to think about. And I'm glad you brought that up in just like a very sensitive and compassionate way. And it gets me thinking more about people who do see reality differently, whether schizophrenic or et cetera. I have two things I want to say about this. And one I don't know if this is true at all. I'm going to fact check myself and comment in the show notes after this, but I have heard that there's some tribal colonies. I don't know where instead of treating schizophrenia like a disease, they use these people and they keep them integrated in society and they keep them as like wise people or storytellers. And then they end up doing a lot better because there's, it's like you said, you know, it's just one part of their brain that's degraded. It's the whole person's still a person. 
And so instead of ostracizing them from society, these tribes keep them integrated into society with a role that's better suited for the way their brain works because they could be storytellers or whatever. Have you heard of this? I haven't heard of that specifically, but I really hope that it's true. And I think it translates to other populations with other issues as well, even or even like aging populations, right? The worst thing that we can do is cut someone off from society and cut someone off from opportunities to figure out how to do things well for them and how to interact with their environment in a way that gives them joy or inspires them or motivates them. And there's a different, there's a different plug and a different type of world that appeals to everyone. So I think about like, it's best if we can keep elderly people involved in some way and keep them motivated because what's life if you don't have something to live for, right? Yeah. And for people who ha are on like the autism spectrum or something like that, it's just that your brains just need things to be set up just a little bit differently. And if we took time to figure out how they needed their world to be shaped in order for them to be a little bit more successful, that would be the best solution because ultimately we don't have to resort to medication if we don't have to, right? It's better to just figure out a way to do it naturally. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and yeah, the second thing I was going to say with that, because I'm just curious about the schizophrenic brain and their reality versus our reality yeah. is, and I said this with quotations for those yeah. of you who just listening, is, I, and I'm circling back to what you commented on earlier about dreams, because mm -hmm. people who are schizophrenic see things that aren't necessarily, I'm saying this with quotations again, they're not necessarily there. Is that because that there's a possibility of their gradient between the dream world and the waking world is that veil is a little bit thinner? So it's almost like they're dreaming in reality? So I think we have to put dream and, and delusions in slightly different categories just because the neural circuitry that we study for both is slightly different. So I would think of it, I would think of the hallucin the hallucinations and delusions that they experience more in terms of in the conscious mind, right? We're not conscious when we're dreaming. So that's a little, that's a different state. But in the conscious mind, I would think of them more as just different representations of the same reality, just that their inputs are different and they're coming up with a different story and they can go down different trajectories because of it, which are often Got it. far more interesting. So they're, so they're interpreting the same data. They still have the same data. Like I'm looking at a tree, they're looking at a dragon. So their brain takes the green and they think that's the color of the dragon. They take the leaves and those are the dragon's scales. They take the mm -hmm. shape of the tree and it could be the dragon's neck. Is that how, like, because their brain, we are all taking in the same information, but they're reprocessing it differently. And that's where the delusion comes from. Is that correct? So Somewhat. I would say they're not taking in the information in the same way that you are, which would lead to these types of delusions, even though it looks on the outset that like they're looking at the same tree you are, they might not be perceiving the same tree you are, right? They might instead be perceiving this dragon. And if they perceive a dragon, then like they're going off on a totally different place and storyline than you would be walking through a park, right? There might be a little bit more challenge on their adventure in an afternoon, but in in terms of kind of thinking about how their brain might also be structured to support that interpretation, there's there's something called loose association that takes place in the brain of people who have schizophrenia, which allows them to make connections between things that we wouldn't normally make connections to and can lead them to, I guess, when you think about it from a neural pers perspective, you want to think about it as like, we have a certain group of neurons that are pretty predictably going to be activated when we experience a certain thing, theirs take a totally different path. And so they're bringing in all kinds of other information while also taking in the information from the outside world that we are. Um, but they're adding a lot more to it and therefore perceiving something very different. Wow. Because um, they're, I, I don't know, more creative. In a way, that's almost kind of beautiful. It's, yes. it's so strange to think about just how complicated the brain is. And that even kind of makes me think about the, I don't know where I was going with this, but just all the different brain types out there mm -hmm. and how somebody might have sort of like a superpower. Like I've seen the 60 Minutes documentary where there was the super recognizers. They never yeah. forget a face and they can see a face of an old person 
and a baby and be and have a whole bunch of them and they can match those. Yeah, so those people's brains would do something like that, where it just takes in that information different than my face or different than my brain. Yeah, and they can pinpoint the face to the age every time. Or people who have face blindness, they're not taking mm-hmm. in that information; they can't see a face at all. Exactly, and I would say that there's another component there to consider, um, which is that type of a situation and that type of a superpower is often both a blessing and a curse because we have this brain, we have a finite amount of compute power is probably the best way to think about it. And you can spend that cup in any way, shape or form you want. But if you devote a lot of power to one area, it's often because you're losing it from somewhere else. And so that's another principle that you can think about when you think about savant behavior, which is a very small portion of folks that are on the autism spectrum but they have these superpowers and they're able to do things that most humans can't, but they often really struggle in other areas of their life because of it. Yeah. The savant thing is super interesting. So if we, so we've pretty much proven that's real, like, uh, you know, the five-year-old that can learn how to play the saxophone and master it like that happens. Wow. That's amazing. It wasn't Mozart considered to be a savant because he was playing full symphonies by the time he was seven. I don't know, but I would not be surprised. <laughs> yeah, I one of my favorite movies about him is the movie Amadeus, and that came out so long ago, I think in the 80s. But it's such an interesting story about how his life was. And because he was a child prodigy, he grew up to be kind of a messed up adult who was not very well adjusted because he was only good at one thing, and that was writing music and playing symphonies. And yeah. he couldn't function in society in other ways. Yeah. So... Let's talk a little bit more about Total Recall. Given our current understanding of how we can implant memories or not, do you think we're on a trajectory to be able to do this a little bit more? I think we probably could. I think we probably won't. Because I think that right now the next revolution in technology is really this like machine learning and AI space. And that really, I think, is the next frontier of a big push that also has its ethical considerations, right? And people are already kind of nervous about that. And that's just a computer. (laughs) I can only imagine the pushback uh, that you would get if you really went down this path in humans. And I'm not even sure how you would be able to go about it, right? Because it seems unfair to target patients who are experiencing troubling scenarios with these experimental like memory manipulation techniques so there are some ethics to be considered there like is it fair to do this to them but you also couldn't really do it in someone who's not experiencing any complications with their memory because you couldn't really justify it like why (laughs) so unless people just like voluntarily which uh i'm forgetting his name but this guy who was informed that he voluntarily gave up. Oh, yeah, identity, Arnold's character. Right? Unless people did something like that and really opted in for science, I don't see it like becoming a reality or certainly not an ethical one. Maybe this is happening in like a basin underground somewhere. Um, or and- another country that may not care about ethics the same way. Yeah. Who knows? More, de- more other, I don't even want to say developed countries, but other countries. I know some. Yeah have stronger ethics committees and some have looser ethics committees. We can say it that way. So is there anything else you want to talk about with memories, fear, memory implantation before we get to our reality check moment? I don't think so. I think we've covered a lot of really interesting stuff and uh, this has been really fun for me. So if you have any other questions, I mean, I'd be happy to keep in touch and help out. Yeah. Well, I think the only other thing that I could talk about forever is dreams, but I am sure I will like find someone (laughs) who will do a whole episode on Inception and we can talk about dreams till the cows come home then. So here's our reality check moment on a scale of one to five, going from pure fiction, speculative science, fringe reality, emerging fact, and science fact. How plausible is that for us to implant memories in the same way that we did in Total Recall? So I'm going to have to go with emerging fact here, which I think is a four on that scale if I have it graded in the correct direction. And the reason for that is like we have a foundation of understanding from a neuroscience perspective to understand how a 
quite a few pieces of this puzzle work and be able to play with it enough to be dangerous enough to have people question our ethics. <laughs> so I think the potential is there, whether or not it's uh, feasible to implement to a point where it would reach what we saw in Total Recall is another question. But I do think there's quite a bit of feasibility, and I hope that we've successfully demonstrated that. Wow, course. that's amazing. And, you know, I we this is just the running joke now. I have not had an episode yet where we haven't brought up Uncle Ben from Spider-Man. And with great power comes great responsibility. And there's just this demand in the scientific community to remain ethical and responsible in the practices that we're doing. Because it's like you said, yeah, we could use this for good and we could help people with traumatic memories or someone like me where it's even a simple thing where I just don't want to be scared on airplanes anymore. Or we could help people go on lovely vacations without leaving the comfort of their home. That could yeah. be really fun for somebody who maybe isn't physically able to do or experience certain things. So those are really cool, positive things that we could do. But on the other hand, we saw in Total Recall just how terrifying and horrible this could go. So it's just a reminder, Uncle Ben, with great power comes great responsibility. And we just hope that the scientific community continues to do uh good as we move forward. So Dr. Wright, if there, we're going to be wrapping up here now, is there any, if you want people to contact you or not contact you or follow up on any of the research that we talked about or concepts that we talked about, do you have recommendations for books, blogs, et cetera, for people to follow up on with some of the concepts we talked about? Books and blogs. Let's see, probably, oh, actually there's one book called The Brain That Changes Itself by Norman Deutsch. And I have been tuning the horn of this book for many years now. And for people who are really interested in getting a digestible, but like sophisticated enough understanding of how the brain works and how you can really change your brain, I think that's a great book to read. And you learn about things that you really didn't think were possible and are pretty mind blowing in a medical setting. So definitely check that out. And I am, of course, open if anybody has questions after this or uh, wants to bring anything new to my attention since I left my lab bench two years ago. I'm always happy to learn new things and picture you. Well, we'll leave your uh, contact information in the description below. And thank you so much, everybody. This has been another episode of Reality Check.